Welcome to video 4 for week 10. This is the last of the generalization videos for the derivative, trying to figure out what the derivative means in higher dimensions. And this time we're going to generalize the idea of linear approximation. So for a single variable function, the derivative gave us a linear approximation in this way, that the function was approximately equal to its value at a point times the derivative of a point multiplied by x minus a. And this is, equivalently is the, the equation of the tangent line the tangent line being the graph of the linear approximation, gave, gave us the linear function that was most like the function we were studying near a point a in its domain. And if I group this a little bit, if I put the a over here, um, I have f of x minus f of a here, then I can think of this as this and this with a multiplication term between them. So this is sort of like shifting this point to the origin and thinking about the function like a multiplication. And this is a way of understanding linear functions. It's linear functions are composed of multiplying by some value and then some shifts of the x and y coordinates. And this is nice because this relates to the notion of a linear function in higher dimensions. Linear functions in higher dimensions, we talked about early in the course, are represented by matrices. Well, in one dimension, we would have a one by one matrix. So I actually want to think of this thing as a one by one matrix that relates this term to this term. So I use f of a to shift the y coordinate, I use a to shift the x coordinate. So I've sort of shifted everything to the origin instead of this point a that I started with. And once I've shifted everything to the origin, the function is essentially multiplying by this, acting by this one by one matrix whose coordinate is the derivative. That's a strange idea, but that idea generalizes nicely. So let's go on. So say now I have a scalar field with two inputs. If I shift the output to the origin and I shift the input to the origin, then I can think of this as being approximately like a linear function. Well, what's a linear function? A linear function is action with a matrix. And so this would have to be a one by two matrix because it would have to act on this two by one column and would take these two pieces of input and give this one piece of output. So the question is, is there such a matrix? Well, what we did in video three is we gave the equation the equation of the tangent plane. And if I think of that as a graph, then it gives me this. If I think of that instead of the equation of a tangent plane as the graph of an approximation to the function, then the function is approximately its value, which again I can shift over here, and the coordinates of this action are the partial derivatives. So then the function can be thought of as the matrix of partial derivatives acting on the variables shifted to the origin at the point a, b. In this sense, the matrix of partial derivatives is the linear approximation to the function at, at, at a point if all of the information at that point is shifted to the origin. And it has to be shifted to the origin because that's the only way we really understand linear functions because they have to preserve the origin. So here's shifting the output, here's shifting the input, here's the action of a two by one, or a one by two matrix. Let me quickly go through some examples of what this looks like. I'm gonna use the same examples I used for video three, where we talked about the equation of tangent planes. So here's the same scalar field. Here are its partial derivatives we calculated in video three. Uh, we evaluated this at zero, zero, and at one, one. So evaluating at the zero, zero says that this function at the origin is approximately equal to its value at the origin, uh, which was just one. And then this action of the matrix of partial derivatives, but both the partial derivatives evaluated to zero. So this function was approximately just constant one. And that makes sense, because that was sort of the top of the hill where I had a horizontal plane of one. At the top of a hill, a function is approximately constant. That sort of makes sense. At one, one, the value at 1, 1 was 3. The partial derivatives in video 3 evaluated to negative 2 ninths. So I get uh, this value at 1, 1. And then the action of this matrix on this vector, which gave me something that looks very much like the equation of the tangent plane that I calculated 
in video three. And I could do this at some other points as well. I could do it also at negative two, two. Same idea, this is the x partial derivative, this is the y partial derivative. I shift by my points, so x minus negative two is x plus two, y minus two. And if I do this action, act with this matrix on this vector, I get something that again looks very much like the equation of the tangent plane. I could do some more examples as well. So here's a new one that I haven't seen before. This is its x partial derivative, this is its y partial derivative. So if I want to approximate it by a linear function at 2, 2, well, I'll have to calculate its value at 2, 2, which is going to be 4. I have to calculate the value of this partial derivative at 2, 2, which is going to be 4 plus 4. This partial derivative at 2, 2, which is going to be negative 2. Act on x minus 2, y minus 2. And that matrix action will give me this linear function that will approximate my function near the point 2, 2. I could do the same thing at the point negative 1, negative 1. This is the x partial at that value. This is the y partial at, at that value. Feel free to check that these partials do in fact give those terms. Uh, x minus negative one is x plus one. Y minus negative one is y plus one. And then this matrix acting on this vector gives me this linear approximation. So let me try and put this all together. We've got a bunch of things that represent a derivative. We've got a rate of change, we've got a slope of a tangent line, and we've tried to extend these into higher dimensions. We started with partial derivatives, we did gradients, we did directional derivatives, uh, we talked about movement along curves, which is sort of like directional derivatives, but use the chain rule. We talked about tangent hyperplanes, and now we've talked about linear approximations. All these things sort of fit together. All of them are using the partial derivatives. The partial derivatives are pieces of the gradient. They're pieces of the equation of the tangent plane. They were the coordinates of the matrix that is the linear approximation. So we might say, well, maybe the partial derivatives are the fundamental thing here. What I want to argue, which is sort of a hard argument to make at this point, but I want to say it anyway, is that this last thing should actually be considered the best complete idea of what's going on. And this seems strictly strange since linear approximation was sort of an afterthought for single variable calculus. It wasn't the biggest idea. But this really does capture exactly what the derivative is doing. The graph of this is the hyperplane. The gradients and the partial derivatives are all sort of properties of the linear approximation. So the linear approximation gathers all this information together. It has all the partial derivatives in it, in its matrix. And it gives us a really nice notion of what a derivative should be. It turns out this is also the best notion going forward. Some of you will see this in Calculus 4. And if any of you do more advanced analysis, you'll see this frequently. That the best generalizing idea of a derivative is that a derivative should be a linear approximation. So if I have a single variable function, and then I look at the derivative of it at a point, well, that's a multiplicative factor that tells us that locally at that point, the function sort of acts like multiplication by this factor. That's what a linear function is in a single variable after you've shifted things to the origin. So we can actually interpret the derivative of a single variable function as the multiplicative factor of a linear approximation. And then that generalizes, generalizes into the linear approximation and it's expressed as the matrix of partial derivatives. So lastly, let me give you the name for that thing. The matrix of partial derivatives of a function is called the Jacobian matrix, and that will be quite important in calculus four and is an extremely important object in all of analysis going forward. So that's the idea I wanna leave you with. It's not the easiest idea to get a grasp on. It's sort of a strange one. I haven't given you the full reasoning for it. A lot of it depends on future mathematics, but I'd like you to think of the derivative as a linear approximation expressed by the matrix of partial derivatives. And my statement to you is that this is the best, fullest generalization of what a derivative is for higher dimensional functions.